Well, this morning we are in part two of Entertaining Angels. And you might have said after last week's message, uh, Matt, Matt, you didn't talk about entertaining angels last week. Guilty as charged. And when I get done with this sermon, you might say, uh, uh, Matt, Matt, did you have like three introductions in this sermon and then finally got to round to your main? Yes, guilty as charged again. I never said it would be pretty. Uh, last week, we talked about angels, just not about entertaining them. We talked about a number of things that are known about angels. And to say that we would ever cover everything, uh, I mentioned you know, Dave's list that he put together, um, 50 fantastic facts about angels. And uh, even 50 facts, what do you figure, Dave? That's about half, maybe, maybe, maybe two thirds of the scriptures that... Maybe a third. Maybe a third, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and my offer stands. If you want a copy of that, see Dave, he'll give you a copy of it. <laughs> Easy for me to offer, right? We talked about how angels are messengers. That's kind of the key word in the Bible, um, both Old and New Testament. Um, they, they bring messages from God. They were created by God. They are not omni, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. They're not God. They are creatures created by God. Uh, we don't know how many exist. We don't know when they were created. We know they were. I said we cannot prove that there are guardian angels. Now, when I said that last week, I was quoting the list that I was using of information from another gentleman, not Dave Silvers in that case. And so we'll come back to that this week. And uh, we'll, we'll take a look at what that means anyways. Um, angels are examples for us. They always glorify God and they are not to be worshipped. Now that's about eight or nine of the 14 things we talked about last week, but that's sufficient. I'd also like to cover a couple of three or four things that were specific to Dave's list of 50. And then the rest of what we're going to talk about was also in Dave's list, but that's okay. It's, uh, we're, we're, we're all looking at scripture and uh, trying to understand these messengers these uh, burning ones, these awesome, powerful ones, these living creatures. So um, one of the things that Dave, and Dave, I think this was your first one, that angels care about military personnel. Now, I know why Dave put that. He knows a lot of... I know, I know. Yeah, Dave knows a lot of military personnel. Uh, and and the, uh, the scripture there was Acts chapter 10 about Cornelius the first Gentile convert who was a centurion, a pretty high up officer in that regiment, if you will. Uh, we also know that God's angels are holy by choice. Now, how do we know that? Well, because if we look at Revelation 12, we see that when the dragon was cast out of heaven, he swept away a third of the stars of heaven. In other words, not all angels chose to be holy. But the ones that remain faithful to God are holy to him, and they serve him. We know that angels camp around those who revere God. Angels camp around. Take a look at, uh, at uh, Psalm 34, verses 7 and 8. And there are a lot of these scriptures that, when you see them, you go, Oh yeah, I knew that, but when I thought of angels, I didn't think about this scripture. And so, Psalm 34, 7 and 8 says... The angel of the Lord encamps around those who revere him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. And so we revere God. We fear him. We, we give him proper place in our hearts and in our lives, and we know that he is with us. And so as we start looking at some scriptures that might help with the question of guardian angels, scriptures like this help. What else would you call this but a guardian angel? Someone that is assigned by God to be a help and a protector. Now, it's kind of interesting to me, what, what type of protection does an angel provide? Because it's obvious that many times God's people are tormented or even put to death. I find that part of the answer in Jesus' prayer, I believe in John 17, when he's asked that 
These be protected from the evil one. Now you say, okay, what does that mean? That means that he didn't say, Lord, please protect them so they can live to be 90 years old or 95 years old. Christians are going to be persecuted. Christians are going to be put to death. Christians are going to suffer illness and ailments and all the things that people of the world do. Jesus said that the sun shines on the good and the bad, the rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. And so we're not expecting, and we should not expect that everything is going to be perfect in our lives. That is a, that's a tool of the devil to disappoint and discourage us. Give you a perfect example. Last night, was watching a, a PBS thing about, um, was it PBS? Well, I think it was, but I think it was on Netflix. Anyways, about Mark Twain. Mark Twain was a guy who kind of flirted with the idea of believing in God and being a godly person, then he married a godly woman. And not long after they got married, her father died, and then a short time after, Mark Twain and Olivia's son died, 19 months old. And she struggled mightily with, is there a God? Is there a powerful God? Is there a loving God? Why didn't he protect my father? Why didn't he protect my son? I get that. There are a lot of struggles that we have, a lot of emotional uh, turmoil that we have over circumstances in life. But part of it is, if our expectation is that if, if we believe in God, that nothing bad is ever going to happen to us, doesn't work that way. It's not been my experience. Now, my life has been a great life in the Lord, but I've had plenty of times that I could have said, God, why'd you let this happen? Or why didn't this happen the way I wanted it to? And I have to admit that in those moments, I can have a bit of a pity party. And most of you have, have been through a whole lot worse than I've been through. I get it. But what I also get is that when we keep our focus on, on Christ, that he will continue to bring us through. And if it's hard in the meantime, it gets better at the end. And at the end, whatever that means, that we have a testimony, we have something from God. And so when I see scriptures like this about, about uh, the, the angel of the Lord uh, and camping around those who revere him and he delivers them, it's not that he protects us from every bad thing. It's that he uses everything in our lives to help us grow, to make us ready for the next thing that he has for us in serving him. He gives us the opportunity to have that testimony for him. This part wasn't supposed to take that long, but that's okay. <laughs> a fourth thing that, that really got my attention in Dave's list is that angels are curious. And I noted the scripture, 1 Peter 1, 12, because Dave put it in there. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, talking about angels, but they're serving you. When they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. You know, I apologize. The first part's about prophets, not about angels. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. Even angels long to look into these things. How about that? They, they might be called the best servants of God, and yet God didn't say, oh, by the way, this is what I'm going to do, and this is why I'm doing it. You can see him kind of sitting on the edge of a cloud going, oh, what's he going to do next? Didn't I tell you they were not uh, omniscient, all-knowing? Angels are curious. Doesn't that make you curious? It does me. Just to know that uh, God works his plan in his time and in his way. Now, one of our things that we talked about last week is that angels do God's bidding when, when he commands them. And so when he said, uh, hey, hey, Gabriel, I want you to go to Nazareth and talk to this lady named Mary. She's very young, but she needs to hear this message. The angel did that. And so at that point, the uh, plan starts being revealed. Well, let's take a look at, at um, Hebrews chapter 1. And, and this kind of fits in with, with some of these things that we've been talking about. 
So in a sense, it's the second or third first point here. Hebrews 1, 13 and 14. To which of the angels did God say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Now, what does the word minister mean? No, it doesn't mean gets paid by the church. That, that's not what it means. It works out that way, but a minister is a servant. Quite often the word minister is the same word as the word deacon in the New Testament. But the idea is always that, that you're a servant. And a lot of ministers get it wrong. They, they believe themselves to be rulers or the leader of the church. That's never the way the church was intended to be in my observation of scripture. But he's talking here about angels at that point. Are not all angels serving spirits sent to serve those who? Who are angels sent to serve? Those who will inherit salvation. Who's that? That's us. That's right. That is us. So when we talk about angels and camping roundabout and bringing messages and things like that, look what's happening. Angels are serving God in a way that serves us and helps us and draws us nearer to God because of what these angels do. Now, in a sense, it's much more about God and serving him than it is about serving us, but we're not left out of the loop. We're not left out of the equation. So in, in some movies, when, um, and, and I, I think recently in a Star Trek movie I was watching, Scotty said, uh, you know, angels of the Lord help us or something. Maybe that's not a bad thing to say. Maybe that's not bad to say in our prayers, right? I usually think of something else when I hear that, but when I see scriptures like this and how God sends his ministering servants to help us, why not pray and ask God to send angels? Definitely pray and seek the Lord. Are not all angels ministering spirits? Well, secondly, Hebrews 13, 1 through 3. I don't want you to be able to leave today and say that I didn't talk about entertaining angels again. Hebrews 13, 1 through 3. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, or by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Let's go back to that second verse. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Entertaining angels. Does that really happen? Is that possible? Well, a couple things. First of all, the word messenger can be human or angelic. But I have to tell you, I've heard enough stories from people who talk about helping others and then really having no, no other contact, no other way of... I've heard of situations where people help somebody and then it just seems like that person was more than a person. They were God's representative there for that purpose. Um, I'll give you a couple examples. My son, Nate, who's sitting in the back right now, when he was about 10 years old, we were in downtown Cleveland, in one of them big fancy office buildings, we used to go down to Public Square down in downtown Cleveland. There was about two small block area there that was open. And, and uh, one time when we were down there, uh, Nate's brother Joel was with us and he looked over and the, the, the BP gas stations, their American headquarters were right down there on Public Square. And so there's a big BP sign in this fancy, fancy office building. And Joel said, wow, that gas station's pretty fancy. But anyways, we were down it was an office building, not a gas station. Anyways, we we're getting ready to go into a building. I can't remember what the purpose was. And a man came up to us and asked for help. 
And Nate, 10 years old, reached in his pocket, took $5, all the money he had in the world, and gave it to the guy. Now, that was probably about all I had right at that point too, but I wasn't moved that way, but Nate was. Now, was that a homeless guy? Was that a somebody that was uh, just, just trying to pull one over on people? Was that an angel? Was that a representative of God in whatever form? So a lot of my son's heart that day. Here recently, I was walking out of my house and down into the driveway and about to get in my car, and I saw a man walking across the street. It seemed like he was struggling a bit. And I walked across and I said, Sir, can I give you a ride? He said, sure. Come to find out, he only lived about a block and a half from my house, but that's okay. I didn't mind. Introduced myself. He introduced himself, Floyd Jones. Come to find out, he lives in a mobile unit behind the, the church right down the block from our house. I didn't think anybody lived there or would live there. We talked. He invited me to church. Yeah. It was interesting because not this last week, but the week before, I got invited to church by people two and a half times. <laughs> well, the third time wasn't really an invite, but it was close. Now, are, are those angels? Was Mr. Jones a, an angel? Was he a messenger from God? Certainly. Now, I, I believe that God does send angelic angels and that there are times that we encounter them. The message that I got from it was, man, it's about time for us to start inviting people again. Let's, let's be done with, I, I know we need to still wear masks sometimes and whatever, that's fine. The, the crazy COVID, one of the crazier things is that even those of us who have received the vaccine can still get COVID, carry it. Weird, it's not what I expected, did, did you? Yeah. <laughs> but it's time to let people know that there's someone greater than ourselves, someone greater than this, this crazy government that we live under. And it was crazy five years ago and 10 years ago and 20 and 30, I'm not saying it's anything brand new. But we as believers in Christ need to make sure that Jesus is our one and only. Now, do what the government says, of course, but worship God and serve him. It's time to get past the, the things that waylay us. Well, in Genesis chapter 18, I'm not going to read any specific verses, but Abraham and Sarai, Sarah, encountered angels. As a matter of fact, they were kind of walking through, and Abraham went up and made lunch for them and invited them in. And eventually, they told Abraham that, Abraham that uh, he and Sarah were going to have a child, and Sarah laughed. And it wasn't a happy laugh. What 9 year old woman would be excited about that news that she was going to have a baby a year later? In Genesis 19, Lot encounters angels. When they come into Sodom, he invites them into his home. God used angels as messengers. In 3 John, verses 5 through 8, and uh, if you're familiar with 3 John, you'll know that there's only one chapter. Where's my magic marker? That's not Rhonda's mistake, that's mine. 3 John, which is only like this far from 2 John. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out receiving no help from the pagans. We ought therefore to show hospitality to such people that we may work together for the truth. John says, hey guys, people are going out as messengers from Christ. Help them out as you go. Because we are fellow workers together. It's a very strong term. 
that John uses here. He says they go out and the world doesn't help them. We can't expect them to. As a matter of fact, in, in uh, another place, either in second or third John, he speaks about someone that, that loves to be first and isn't gonna allow help to these people. And so these messengers need help. We might encounter human messengers that God wants us to help. We need to, to be open to that and uh, be used by him for that. Well, would there be angels around us? Yes, to encourage us, to bring messages from God, reminders. By the way, an interesting thing to me is in Luke chapter 24, when Jesus was the messenger that they didn't recognize. You remember on the road to Emmaus, that uh, two disciples were walking, one named Cleopas, I believe, the other one's name is not given. And a guy kind of comes up and starts walking with him and talking, and you know, it turns out it's Jesus. What does that tell us? Keep your eyes open. There might be people that are in need of a message of Christ, and there might be Christ or representatives of Christ, but be open to how God is going to show us his next thing in our lives. Let's go to uh, Psalm 91. Psalm 91, 9 through 13. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Now, this passage is quoted in Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus is being tempted. And of course, it was quoted by, Satan. <laughs> yes, by Satan. Yeah. Now, it's not that the scripture is bad. It's that Satan takes truth and twists it into a lie. You know, look, look at what Satan does. He, he says, uh, you know, man shall not live by bread alone. Well, Jesus said that part. But he said, turn the, the stones into, into bread. In other words, hey, God's supposed to provide for you. So you don't trust him. You just use your powers to do this. But in this one, Satan takes him to a high point, pinnacle of the temple, it's called, three, four hundred feet up, and says, throw yourself down. He's supposed to give his angels charge concerning. Jesus says, do not put the Lord your guide to the test. In other words, if you feel like God is telling you to go stand out in front of a train, don't. That's not God. Now, I suppose there's a one-tenth of one one-hundredth of a chance that God might tell somebody to do that, but no, he won't. Now, there are lots of times that we have an opportunity to put ourselves in, in harm's way or in danger. Let's make sure we're doing God's will and God's work so that his angels can protect us. Let's not be foolish. Acts chapter 12, 6 through 16. Peter is helped, released by an angel. Uh, let me go ahead and, and read these, these verses here. It's faster than trying to describe it. Acts 12, 6 through 16. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison. But he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. 
Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant named Rhoda came to, the, to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. Oh, thank you very much. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Now, would we be so astonished wouldn't we be the ones who said, God, you're answering our prayer. Thank you very much. Open the door, let him in. Because they were praying for Peter, for his safety, for his release, and he was safe and he was released. But we do the same thing, don't we? It's kind of our human nature, too. Well, we're laying out our fears and our sorrows and our emotions. and That's why we talk about trusting God more and more every day. So here this angel comes in. He is not limited by the bars, by the chains, by the gates. God sends him. He goes, Peter's released. I find it interesting that when she hears Peter's voice and she knows it's Peter, but they won't believe her, and they say it must be his angel. What, what did that mean? Well, couple things. Maybe they meant more like he's dead and that's his, his soul that's been released. Maybe they meant it was his messenger, somebody who was staying by Peter watching to see what was happening. I, I, I can't answer specifically. Maybe they thought it was Peter's guardian angel, the one who was with him, helping him. Well, feel free to study into that and if you have different conclusions or understanding, come back to me. Let me know. But what we see here is God at work. Now, Peter eventually would be put to death, but this wasn't his time. This wasn't the way that he was going to die. And so he would continue to serve Christ. He would not be discouraged by the arrest or by the treatment that he received. He would continue to uh, do what God wanted him to do. Let's go to Matthew 18. 1 through 5, and then verse 10. Matthew 18, 1 through 5, and then verse 10. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Ah, oh, those arrogant guys. Me, 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 Jesus, tell them it's me, tell them it's me. He called a little child to them and placed the child among them. He said, Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, instead of acting so childish, that's what he could have said, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Now down to verse 10. See, see that you do not despise or think little of one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Now this is as good an example as we have of a guardian angel, don't we? I'm not sure that guardian angel is exactly the way we think of it. And I think that's what the other gentleman was saying when the thing that I read last week about not proving that they're guardian angels. Obviously, there are guardian angels. There are angels that, that by serving God serve us. There are angels that because we fear God or revere him, they, they camp around us and help us. There are angels that bring our requests before God. There are all kinds of ways that angels help us and serve us and guard us from the evil one when we want to be free of the evil one, by the way. A while back, I heard a fellow talking about... Uh, how some people have a lot of trouble getting free from sin. And he said, God will not protect us from our friends, but he will protect us from our enemies. If we make sin our enemy, God will protect us from it. If it's still our friend, all bets are off. That's my summation of what the man said. He didn't use that last phrase. Guardian angels, why not? Why not? When, when I look at, at what the scripture says, 
it talks about how angels protected Jesus, protected Eli Elisha, protected Lot, protected Daniel, protects those of us who will inherit eternal life. Why not children? What about those who are new to the faith? What, at what age would God stop protecting us if he only protects children? Lots of questions, not as many answers in some of these things. The bottom line is that God loves us. He sends his angels to give us messages, to watch over us, protect us, help us. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 6, and we're, we're getting close to the end here. 2 Kings chapter 6. Now the king of Aram, which is Syria, by the way. Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God, Elisha, sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, tell me, which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, the Lord my king, said one of his officers, trying to protect his own neck, by the way. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go and find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my lord, what shall we do, the servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness. As Elisha had asked, Elisha told them, this is not the road and this is not the city. Sounds like a Jedi mind trick, doesn't it? These are not the, dro the droids you want. <laughs> you have to follow me into the city. I, I, I don't know if the Jedis did this or not. I don't even know where I was here. And he led them to Samaria. How about that? And after they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? No, nah, don't kill them, he answered. Would you kill those you have captured with your own sword or, or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. Hey, these guys have had quite an experience here. So he prepared a great feast for them, and after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away, and they re returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. Can you imagine? You're one of the mightiest armies on the face of the planet. You're going after one guy who's got one servant with him, and you're going to just take this guy out for, you, for your master, the king. And you can't get in. I don't know that they saw the angels, but they couldn't get in. They couldn't get after Elisha. You heard the scripture. Elisha prayed and asked that they be struck blind. They were, took care of the problem. I'm sure just the fact that they were struck blind and then had their sight returned to them when Elisha prayed again. And then they got fed a feast by their opponent, King. And Elisha said to his servant, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. You know, if, if we prayed and God answered the prayer that we see the angels in this room. First of all, we would see Jesus. 
whether he's sitting next to Malcolm or Cameron or Sammy or Janet or whoever. Where two or more are gathered in his name, there he is in our midst. Or whether we would see angels. And, you know, the, some of the, the silliness of the Middle Ages, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? You know what that's about? That's about the nature of angels. Because if they're physical, then there's a limited number of angels that can dance on the head of a pen, no matter how big or small they are. But if they're spiritual beings, which they are, then unlimited number. That, that, it's a simple question. But when guys want to prove they're right, they're living in a monastery, and there's, well, anyways. Let's just say they, they didn't have any baseball to watch or anything like that, so they argued. But the bottom line is that even if there's only one or two angels, I think about Numbers chapter 22. I think about a guy named Balaam. And Balaam was riding his donkey and they, they both had an experience that they would never forget. Because Balaam wanted to go and do something that God didn't want him to do and the donkey refused to go. And the donkey went out into a field and the guy started beating his donkey and then the donkey rubbed against the fence and, and hurt Balaam's leg and he beat the donkey. And finally he said, why are you doing this? And the donkey said, don't you see the angel up there? <laughs> Which was more surprising, the donkey talking or the angel? Both, yeah. God's presence form of angels. We have more with us than the enemy has with him. What a great privilege for us to draw near to God, to put our trust in him, to know that he really cares for us. Father, I thank you. What an incredible God that you are, that you have made creatures like this and you've made us. Father, so often we feel weak, we feel uh, helpless, but to know that you've given us help already. Father, you've given us your spirit, you're willing to fill us with your spirit. You've given us angels, these, these messengers, these, these powerful, powerful warrior beings. Help us, Father, to draw near to you and to seek your help in all of our circumstances in life. Thank you for being with us and blessing us. Help us to be a blessing to those around us, to, to carry the message that have been brought to us in Christ. In his name we pray, amen. If there's anyone who needs Jesus as their savior, maybe you've been convicted of your sinfulness and your need for forgiveness, of your hopelessness and your need to, to put your hope in Christ. We believe that, that the first and foremost response to what Jesus has done is to believe in him and to begin to put our faith, our trust in him. Then we confess our need for him and our sinfulness. We repent of our sins. We're baptized into Christ. And what we see in the Bible is that baptism means being put under the water because we're dying to sin and self. We're being buried with him. We're being raised up to walk in a new life in him. Then we uh, strive to be faithful to him and continue to grow in our knowledge of him and in our faith in him. And so we want to draw near to him. You know, if, if you're watching this online, if you're seeing a video of this later on, uh, please contact us. Uh, we'd be happy to talk with you uh, by, by phone, by Zoom, set up a meeting here in the church, whatever. But we wanna help you to understand. For those of you who are here in the room, same thing. You know, please talk to somebody and find out what your response to Jesus should be because of what he's done for you.